right. Hello and good evening, everyone. Today I'm speaking to the host of the uh, Geopolitics and Empire podcast. He does this cool in, uh, intro. His name is uh, Gerboye. I hope I get that right. Is that good? What's cracking? No, I'm all good. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess I invited you over to, to this channel to come and talk a little bit because you're covering a lot of geopolitical stuff. Why, why are you into geopolitics? What's the story behind that? I guess you can trace it back to my days at the Geneva School of Diplomacy. And then, you know, my outlook as a youth was always like, I want to know what's the big picture, what's happening in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I went to grad school and learned about geopolitics, I mean, I, I kind of chose the name geopolitics and empires. Like, it's sort of, ex it's like the science of politics. It, 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 you know, whenever I think of a cool name for a podcast, let's take it. <laughs> like, that's a problem. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I figured, uh, actually, my podcast was initially called, like, Guadalajara Geopolitics Institute. I had no idea what I was doing, and then I realized that's not yeah. a good name. You want to have, like, just two words. And there, there are other cool podcasts, like Guns and Butter, um, you know, Geopolitics and Empire, like two words, basically, you want to have. Right. But, yeah, ge geopolitics, for me, just kind of explains, you know, you, it takes into the equation everything, you know, de demographics, geography, economics, technology, economy war you know military, everything information warfare so yeah but but there isn't really like a definition of it was there is there like a formal i mean the, formal the, there are definitions but i don't think there's really like one definition there are different schools different you know mm. variations but i mean that's sort of my definition i view as you know ge geo politics some, some people say you know geopolitics is outdated now but um i think it's still very useful i, I think last few years has taught us if anything it's more relevant you know yeah, and, and empire as well, because this, this is what it's all about. The end game is global domination, world government, whichever way you want to cut it. And ge geopolitics is, it, 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 to rephrase it, it's like the science of world government, basically. <laughs> the science of world government. Geopolitics and empire, you know, so. Yeah, well, power power relations, how stuff like that works, dominance groups. I, I, I tend to see things these these days in dominance hierarchies. I've gotten into that recently. Um, but that's also the problem with analyzing the world is that you get an idea and then you want everything to sort of bow to that idea, right? And it sort of you can go crazy thinking of any any approach to analyze the world. Yeah, that's why you always got to be uh, reframing uh, things as you get new evidence. But I mean, I do still have this loose view that, you know, I mean, it's, it's, I always I'm not uh, afraid to mention my biblical, you know, Christian perspective that you know we are there are dark forces and they're moving us towards their goal which is right. global, global concentrated power and i think now more and more people are just seeing this as evident oh okay that's interesting so i mean see so when did you start your podcast when was it 20 i mean 2012 is when i started skyping mm -hmm. um, experts into my classroom and you can go to my channel on youtube it's called uh, the old channel is called dissident thinker and you'll find uh, people like Ray McGovern, Peter uh, Dale Scott, uh, Paul Craig Roberts. You, you start you started off of Peter Dale Scott already. But, yeah, I mean, that was like this like 10 years ago and and even oh. my uh, John Perkins the economic hitman I interviewed and then mm -hmm. then I switched to making like a proper podcast like 2015 2016. Oh okay. Oh, it's interesting. I mean, you've been covering interesting topics. I mean, I, I only discovered you after they censored Francis Boyle. <laughs> so I don't know if it was good ads for you, but... Uh, it was. Uh, I mean, it's a, a virtual uh, purple heart, as they call it. <laughs> oh, okay. That's an idea. And uh, on which platforms have you been kicked off yet? Um, well, I haven't really been kicked off. Spotify took off uh, one episode only. Um, mm -hmm. I got up to two strikes on YouTube, three and you're out um no, I uh, two by now i mean yeah, yeah i've been banned from patreon and most recently from paypal um th that's and i i did have my vimeo account i had a paid vimeo account and they just deleted my account one day and i tried to contact customer service and later they reinstated it saying like it was an error but after that i don't trust them anymore so. because he, your name was mentioned alongside consortium news and those guys when it was banned i think yeah that's the paypal issue that's why i think okay. it's the department of homeland security because it was the same week that the dhs rolled out the disinfo governance board 
and that's in week consortium and press and myself were banned from paypal so again you put into the context of recent revelations it's dhs telling paypal what to do mark zuckerberg and joe rogan recently said fbi telling facebook what to do and uh we had alex berenson the new york times former journalist finding messages showing that the white house was telling twitter to deplatform him so now we have a clearer image of the how they work together the private big tech uh, you know fascism basically the, the government and big tech well the, the one that's still scary to me is this uh, trusted news initiative that all these big companies are into um it's uh, just crazy that you know all the news is sourced from i think five locations or five like it's five corporates sourcing all your news so you know what how much of it should you trust or shouldn't you trust i don't know most of it you shouldn't try. <laughs> like, <laughs> well yeah I, I mean people say that but i i, I had a conversation here um, before with the editor of the um, sunday times uk you based and i asked him this question and you know he's still into um uh, basically saying but you know they get to verify and check and it i i would agree with him that some things in the news is more you know thoroughly analyzed and stuff like there's still a lot of truth in it it's just there's a level of bs involved in it as well that you, you just cannot ignore anymore. Well, I, I kind of apply the scientific method. You know, you try to formulate a hypothesis and extrapolate and time will tell, you know, whether your forecast on a certain issue is correct or not. And then, of course, you're using MSM and non MSM uh, sources. And then, yeah. you know, who's more who's who's right more often and what sources are they using? And so you, you get what I'm saying. And if you follow a lot of the official MSM people, they've been getting everything wrong. But I, I but I, as you say, I, I do read everything. People flip out on my yeah. Telegram ch channel where I post news all the time. I posted something from the New York Times uh, the other day, and it's it's not like that that you agree with it, but you have to you have to read everything. So, but 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 that's the thing though. It's that even these main sources, they they, it's not that they lie. I, I wouldn't say something is obviously lying. I think over there was a lot of that. You know. But but some of it is just that it is it is so swinged in such a way that, that they want you to lead lead you to another conclusion. So you're like, okay, I agree with the facts, but obviously not the broader story they're trying to tell me. Well, I mean, what would be an example? I mean, we can look at it. Just, I mean, I mean, take Ukraine for example. I mean, the Nation in in 2019 wrote about the neo Nazis in Ukraine. Okay, factually true. Now the Nation is like. Yes, there are some hit squats, but uh, I'm like, okay, what what is going on over here? You understand, you know? Or for example, you know, people in Ukraine would say yes, um, but you know, the neo Nazis were thrown out of power in Ukraine. They they did never had power, I believe, political power. I'm like, okay, that's true. Yes, that cuts through some of the Russian BS. But wait a minute, there is still some dodgy stuff happening as well. You know, that's sort of how I how I see it. So it's like. You know, it's it's not that the facts are wrong necessarily. It's the context and what it is in, in which it's presented that is wrong. I mean, there are different levels of propaganda. So I mean, they they have you know disinformation. They uh, omit truths. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, you could take example of New York Times. You know, twenty years ago, saying Iraq WMDs that was flat out you know false. So. Yeah, that was just a lie. So but I, was it? Was it? I I, I want to challenge there. Was the WMDs a lie? Because I, I was reading an article the other day where like. Um, there was like a maybe story to it as well, you know. So it was like a, I, I know everyone says, okay, there wasn't any evidence. We know Scott Ritter, we know the UN, and we know also South Africa um, reconstituted what was Project Coast, the um, apartheid regime's chemical weapons. They collaborated with the Iraq War, uh, with the Iraq government, and they found there was no evidence of it. But then I was reading an article the other day. They were like, yeah, but they, you must be careful because there is still some. There was still some remnants of some program left. So I'm like, okay. Um, you know, it obviously doesn't justify anything of the war and that stuff, but sort of was it true or wasn't it true? I don't know. I mean, I haven't seen any example. I, I did have a guest on my TNT radio show, an Iraqi uh, American, Ayad, I forget his last name, maybe Rahim, but uh, he was convinced there were WMDs. But I mean, my I had my one of my professors in Geneva was Dutch American international mm -hmm. lawyer, uh, Curtis Dobler, who uh, was on Saddam Hussein's defense uh, <laughs> council. And, right. um, I just I don't I don't see any evidence of of WMDs and so I mean again we have to separate and not like I don't think Saddam Hussein was 
uh, you know, good by any means, but I don't think there were WMDs either. So yeah, and 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 anyways, it was just an excuse to go to war. I think that is like the broader lie that was behind it. So th th that's the th problem, you know. Even if there were other reasons to go to war, I mean, you could have said the Kurds are being killed, which is probably true. Um, you know, it, it was an excuse for oil, probably, <laughs> of influence in the Middle East. Yeah, and if there were the WMDs, they probably would have had uh, receipts from the Pentagon. <laughs> well, I mean, we had, <laughs> in the late eighties. Uh, I, this was in Foreign Policy magazine, MSM. Um, they reported some, a few years ago declassified documents that the gas that the Iraq Saddam used against Iran were from America, sold to him by the U.S. So, you, know, you want to talk about WMDs? So, yeah. So, no, fair enough. I mean, maybe maybe those receipts were more important to to hide as well. But it's it's just a lot of BS. I mean. Okay, so so what what is your approach then? If you look at the if, if you get like a story, I mean, let's say there's another Ukraine war or climate or whatever. Like, what do you what do you sort of do to analyze the news first? Uh, my first thing is like, okay, I get a story. Um, I mean, perfect example. Uh, just the other week, uh, Shoigu, the defense minister of of Russia, it was mm. being reported that he was removed from his role, like overseeing the Ukraine war, because Putin thinks he's doing a horrible job. And the only source, I, I think I found it on Twitter, maybe on Telegram, was some strange Ukrainian news outlet, which is, you know, totally pro-NATO, pro-Pentagon, Ukrainian news. And then it's a British intelligence. And I'm scouring, trying to find other sources, Russian sources, nothing. And so w when I come across a story, I try to, you know, there's a story, and then I try to accumulate sources you know russian sources american sources indian chinese all these different sources so i can have a picture you know of all of the different possibilities of what's going on here and then i just sort of try to then you use like like logic and then your knowledge of history uh and other current uh, information and then you try to formulate your own idea of of what's going on and that's why i assist again people and there are very like pro-russian probably some pro-russia bots as there are pro-nato bots in my telegram channel oh, yeah. and like so, you know the, the pro-russians expect me to post task news agency all the time and only I'm like what that's what's the matter with you or or you know for me to post pro you know uh you know wall street journal or or new york times all the time and it's like like here's a story just recently that TASS reported that uh russia is going to convene a meeting to discuss u.s bioweapons you know that COVID could have been a, a u.s bio warfare which i think is possible on this issue i I'm, I'm more leaning towards the russian side um but again it's more complicated it's involving china and wuhan but then the new york times came out with a front page piece debunking saying the russians crazy conspiracy theory uh, you know it's a conspiracy theory that the russians are saying COVID was a u.s bioweapon so now you've got these you know the new york times version debunking it the TASS version and that's sort of where you start. And then you start to pick, you know, find other uh, sources, talking to experts as well, talking to people and so on and so forth. So, but but you have to really, I mean, you obviously do, I mean, it's part of your podcast, but you have to dig into every story, technically, you know, uh, as, at least consequential stories. I mean, you can't do it for every story, I suppose. No, no, no way. Yeah. You have yeah. to choose choose your battles, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's it's it's. I mean, I mean, this is one thing that the, the COVID pandemic made me woke up to is is just the level of BS that is spammed at people every day. It's like there's really a, like a battle for your head going on. It's like the final frontier. It's just it's. I'm even I'm just getting worn down by the propaganda, and you just hear rid ridiculous stuff that the stuff that they put out, like they were saying. Uh, for Australia, like, don't travel, have a stay at home vacation. It's like, you know, you will own nothing, you won't go anywhere. Just uh, getting brainwashing people to, uh, you know, submit to something, you know, where in the previous times, it would be something by force. And now they're using this like hypnosis brainwashing to get people to do their their will it's crazy yeah it's a uh, and, and I mean, I, I think what they've done is they it's like they've got like a matrix of um, like certain arguments so i'm going to give them an argument for the community i'm going to give an argument to care for people and for empathy want to be scared of people you know like a list of stuff that works on most people and then they just throw it at they pump every every story into through that matrix and like okay well it works on 60 70 percent and who cares about the rest of the people yeah if, if you have enough people you don't need 100 percent. you just need a, a certain amount and that's it you know so so Getting to the, the geopolitics stuff, I mean, um, some people would 
criticized your politics by saying it's it's always a like a realist approach at looking at the world. I mean, is, is that fair? Was it? I I would uh I would agree. I mean, and and I mean, just to be honest, when I was studying uh, studying uh, international relations and political science. I, I actually I don't like any of this theoretical stuff like you read through all of these different schools of these different isms and for me I didn't I'm more pragmatic and practical and I would say I am more realist because I feel the world is run more by you know money and and power I don't need these armchair ideas I, you know I've heard from these ivory towers of people who haven't seen the real world constructing these theories I'm like no the world is run by brute uh, you know force and <laughs> that's sort of my take and I, I, I would agree largely geopolitics uh, is like that so that's my view I mean there are other mm -hmm. people who, who prefer to have but, but I mean like take for example a practical example like the Russian Ukraine stuff like but what is what is your sense of that of that whole war and how it how it's working out uh, I mean I've mentioned this before I mean you've got the basic history right or that's created the problem right under the Soviet Union Khrushchev giving it Ukraine back you know autonomy so you've already got a problem, you know. And, and we don't we don't you know. even know why he did it. So like, there's no real. It's yeah. like the window party leadership, but it's sort of. Yeah. So you, I mean, you have to take factor in the history, and then uh, I I viewed, I mean, I viewed NATO and Pentagon. They want to destroy Russia, and so they're uh, trying to do it through Ukraine. So I I actually view Russia defending, in a way, defending itself through what it's doing in Ukraine. I know that's I know that's not a popular um uh, opinion but that's how i see it at the moment yet i do recognize there is some talk and some evidence i i don't know if you've mentioned this before that you know russia does want to it's like these two things could be true at the same time you know where russia mm -hmm. is defending itself in the case of ukraine but that russia might have aspirations to uh expand in some ways you know you know what i'm saying it's just like i yeah. i don't view i don't view it as good guy versus bad guy i just kind of view it sort of as bad guy you know or... two two empires at each other's throat basically and and you know russia has maybe lost a little bit of moral authority because they were the invader this time but i mean the idea that <laughs> i mean i want to get your view what what is your view on the probably know the answer already on, on the idea that this was an unprovoked war unprovoked you mean that russia just went in well that's sort of what we're told in the media at the moment but I, I think it's you have to be crazy to believe that no there's no way that can be possible because i mean i vividly recall literally like the last 10 years this is what i've been talking about in my classes at university in mexico on on foreign policy and international relations i can remember like watching clips going back 15 years where putin is saying like 10 years ago you can find him at all these different conferences he's saying they want to defang and declaw the Russian bear. Then there are lectures where Putin talks about like, we know uh, exactly when, because you know, the, the all militaries are modernizing their, their missile ranges, the, the payloads and everything. And he's saying like, we know NATO and the Pentagon, how far their current range of missiles are. And that we know exactly what year their range will be so far that they'll be able to reach it, you know, within any part of Russia. And uh, that kind of so like he's he's using this sort of uh, rhetoric going back years. So that tells you like this is not this is provoked. Um, but I kind of view there are multiple, you know, both sides have multiple uh, goals they're, they're they're going for. Yeah. And so it's very my, 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 my take on this is I think the, the US leadership, particularly guys like John McCain and Lindsey Graham, who went there promising congressional support if they would go on the offensive. I think they were utterly naive about the Russian response, about how much the Russians care about Ukraine. They, they thought this was just going to be another Afghan war, Soviet-Afghan war or something. And I, I think that was the, the major miscalculation. Like it actually meant a hell of a lot to the Russians, whether or not you agree with it or not. You know? I, I would agree because my, I can't give you some scientific explanation, but my sort of gut feeling when this started was that I think the Russians are more calculating and if you if you think about it, yeah, I talked to Tim Kirby, who lives in Russia the other day on my TNT show. Maybe they've got like less resources than the West. So when they go to do something, you know, you, you calculate, you know, when someone who has less money, they calculate, uh, you know, the coins in the supermarket yeah. versus someone who's rich and just go doesn't even think about it. Yeah, they, they have think, to fight asymmetrically. So it's more. Right. And so I think Russia, when they, they I think they 
calculated very carefully and strategically what they're doing in Ukraine. And I, I think they have the upper hand uh, uh, currently. And I think the West has just gotten fat and old and, and complacent and it's declining. I mean, that's just what happens. And I think the West is going to un, uh, unwind. Um, so yeah, as a result, oh, I mean, we're seeing the, 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 the sanctions, the uh, economy, just it's hurting the middle class of Europe and, and the West. So. The yeah, I mean, I was actually, I mean, I, it remains to be seen what will happen this winter in, in France, because I mean, France, um, its benefit has always been that it's got nuclear power. So when there's a gas shock, it tends to be a bit better protected. But this year, um, and I must give the Russians credit for timing, um, the, half the French reactors were offline. They usually sell to the Germans during the summer. So they, they actually knew when the guys were doing maintenance on the reactors. <laughs> um, anyway, so even in France, we might have fuel, fuel rations in the coming winter. And I was wondering, isn't South, South Africa going to be safer than France? You know, well, I, I read, I mean, you're, I think you're in France. You can tell me that I read like the electricity went up a thousand percent. Like, can you tell us? Uh... No, no, home prices, no. They, they Well, um, the wholesale price went up. So the price that the government buys for, but not the price that the consumer pays. The, the French government protected the consumer, but unlike the UK. And what happened is, remember, EDF also sells electricity to the UK. So the French increased. They're making the profits of the UK consumers <laughs> to try and pay for the deficit. So they, they're sort of being entrepreneurial. Um, so that, that's also, by the way, why this was this row between um, Macron and who's this uh, new prime minister of the UK. It, 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 yeah, it had to be with the, had to be with the electricity crisis. But um, the French debt is accumulating. This is the problem. And, and the other thing is that it doesn't matter your financial system or your economic system. If you don't have electricity, you don't have electricity. You know, So th the coming winter is a big test. So now the French have said they're going to put up all, put all their nuclear reactors back online before the winter. Hopefully that's true, but you still France still imports gas. And the funny thing is Macron was now going to Algeria to kiss and make up for the Algerian civil war, um, basically to get gas <laughs> because France is struggling as well. So it, it might even increase even more. I, I guess if there's no electricity, you won't be doing any more uh, live streams. <laughs> well, I mean, in South Africa, we have load shedding since we've been having it since uh, 2008. So I'm quite prepared mentally for when it comes. I know what to do. Uh, I don't know what the French people will do. So, you know, you take time areas and stuff like that. So I, South Africa is exporting our technology to the rest of the world. I feel so proud. You know? Yeah, I, I might have to head back to, to Mexico. I was uh, reading that out of all, all the OECD countries, Mexico had the lowest energy inflation like six percent and everyone else was like 10 50 100 150 percent inflation you know in electricity or or uh... well the the reason the energy inflation is interesting to me is that um none of these green guys want to be honest about what happened because the fingers has to be pointing at them um you know if you put intermittent sources on your grid fine it works when it's beautiful sunny and windy but you make yourself, you expose yourself geopolitically to gas shocks. <laughs> so when this is a gas shortage, prices go up. And I think Me Mexico, and, and this is actually South Africa's benefit at the moment, is we still have a lot of coal. And it seems to me that coal is the most logical thing to do. <laughs> but don't tell that to the environmentalists. Yeah, well, and Mexico's also, I mean, we got our, our oil and uh, subsidized, yeah. government subsidizes the electricity and water and, and, and stuff. So, yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah, that's also, and, and how's, how's it in uh, Croatia, by the way? I mean, things just seem normal for now. I can't really report anything except the usual that you I, you can see just your daily spending is it's it's more expensive and, uh, you know, food, just everything like laundry detergent and uh, something that I quite shocked me. I, I came in July and I bought a SIM card and uh, where are we now? It's September. So in August, the price, the monthly price for the SIM jumped like a dollar and a half. OK, and then. Now in September, it jumped again a dollar and a half. I'm like, what is this? This is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so I think this is probably related to everything that we're uh, discussing. Well, so yeah, I, I mean, it's it's all, you know, I mean, I, I was checking in the supermarket. The um, So our inflation in the supermarket, I think, is 6 7%, which is um, high for Europe, very low for Africa, by the way. We're used to that high level of inflation. Um, but in Germany, it's like 30 40%. But anyway, so I, I went to buy, and usually what I buy, I, I pay, for, so if I used to pay 75 euros, now I would pay 100 for the same items. So, so something is up, but, you know, I still buy the same basket. And 
so yeah, I'm affected, but it's not uh, it's it's not that bad yet that it's painful for me personally. But I think Although, the problem is if, if this extends, if we have to continue living like this, it's gonna be it's gonna be painful, you know. To be well, I I think I think we're gonna be like this for the next decade. I'm very pessimistic about the money that's been printed during the pandemic and that to work out of the system and the energy crisis. You know? No, I definitely agree with you. This is like uh, get used. To, this is I hate using the term the the new normal. Yeah, <laughs> they've won basically. The great reset has won. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you've you've been covering other topics as well. Like I said, it's always a geopolitics, empire, and stuff. But um, you've also been covering like you know deep dives into the World Economic Forum and those type of topics. Like um, how how are they? Are they really that relevant? Or I mean, I, I view it. I think they are very re relevant, and um, in the sense that they are the public face that that we can touch and and see of you know what, what I was alluding to earlier. These darker forces behind the scenes that you know we don't even know the names of some of these wealthy uh, aristocracies probably european that go back centuries so you know that's the power structure you got the behind the scenes behind the curtain wizard which we've got no idea who some of those are and then they've got their their visible structure and if you're going to have like a world government you have to have this visible part i mean you can't like have a secret world government that controls your life maybe no. maybe it's all just an open secret you know maybe that's just well, what I mean, it, is. It, it is you read hg wells a century ago he wrote a book i've got it he talks about the open uh, i forget i think it's called open conspiracy open conspiracy uh, he's talked about it he said the new world order will come and many will die fighting it um and i interviewed johnny vedmore who did a deep dive on wef and um he's got a point like i i'm loosely holding to his theory I, again it goes back to what we were talking about earlier that uh as new evidence comes, I will reconfigure my understanding. But so far, I'm running with what he's got, that basically World Economic Forum goes back to the 70s, where it used to be called uh, European Management Forum, I think, uh, whose goal was to unify Europe and, and US. And even that is an old, it goes back to the 30s, this plan called the Atlantic Union to create like a European Union with, you know, that, that's the building blocks towards world government, to have like a U.S. But, but is, isn't this just an ex another word for empire, for U.S. dominated yeah, exactly. empire? I mean, these are just different ways of saying um, uh, empire, but their goal is a total global empire like we've never seen before in history. And he, he says how uh, Klaus Schwab attended a Harvard seminar, which was sponsored by, run by Kissinger, uh, which was actually funded by the CIA. So he basically says the, C it's, the World Economic Forum is a CIA uh, project, basically. And the goal is... Uh, penetration it's basically global color revolution where you penetrate every single government on the planet to to hook them up into this global control system and then after the fall of the soviet union they were going for the gold uh they got almost all of the world and you know they're going for the remaining you know russia um you know china north korea syria yemen all of these outliers and so yeah i think it, it makes on, yeah. for me it, 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 it makes sense well, I, I mean, I, you go from Croatia, but I mean, like the Yugoslavia story as well. Um, I mean, the bombing of Yugoslavia, for example, you know, breakup. Um, they didn't want to open their banks to the larger world. You know, that was the theory going around. And, you know, this is probably half the truth. I don't think it's, I mean, it's of all these events. I don't think you can put like one single fact and say, aha, I've got it. It's, it's a series of things coming together that makes the structures react. No, I would totally agree. I mean, it's still an uh, enigma. I need to spend more time in figuring out what happened in my own uh, country. And I would agree, like, there's one, uh, like I mentioned with Ukraine, you had the historical context of these divisions, uh, enmity between Serbs and, and Bosnians and, and, and Croats and the religious aspect. I was talking about that uh, here the other day with someone, how, um, you know, the, the religious aspect was heightened um you know, it's part of your identity. So, you know, Orthodox Serbs, Catholic, Croats, uh, Muslim, uh, Bosniaks. And so you've got that kind of pot that's already boiling. And then, um, as you said, I, I've read also in the 80s, the IMF uh, wanted to um, uh, get Yugoslavia indebted. So then you've got the foreign actors as well. So you've got the local cauldron, and then you've got like the IMF and, and the, the British. And, you know, and, and, and they were Al-Qaeda guys there as well. Like there's a lot of stuff that went wrong over there. Because I, I mean, I, I don't know if you've ever read um, Edward Herman's uh, work on it, who wrote the book with, uh, you know, Chomsky. 
um, on manufacturing. I, I, you mean, yeah, you're referring in, in Bosnia, there being uh, Al Qaeda, I think. Yeah, I think in Bosnia. Yeah. Anyway, so I mean, no, he was talking about the breakup of Yugoslavia, the, you know, the whole region and whatever happened. And anyway, it, you know, it's a very interesting view on this stuff. And then it, it was not as black and white um, going back all the way even to Milicevic. Like, there's a lot of stuff that happened. And he made the view that it was like one of these first wars where the propaganda was more important than the actual facts happening, you know? Um, so yeah, there was a lot of breakup, a lot of people killing each other, all that stuff happened, but he, there was no, even though it wasn't even an attempt at, at, at getting an empathetic understanding of, of, from all the sides involved. It was just like a one story falls down and that story served a certain powerful interest. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. And I would like to examine the Milosevic uh, aspect, although, I mean, it's clear that, you know, they, they say there were plans for greater Serbia, but then there are, you know, there's audio where the Croatian, you know, leader Tujman, that uh, there's also evidence that something was, uh, yeah. you know, he was involved in something that maybe wasn't so uh, innocent either, or that, you know, I, I've heard that, you know, Milosevic and Tujman were both, like, they were all d divvying up uh, the Yugoslav um, pie. And so it's like, yeah, those things need to be examined regardless of your own, you know, ethnic background and just looking at it cold and, and calculated. But most people, I don't care where you're from. I mean, uh, again, I'm saying like we were invaded by Serbs, so we had to defend ourselves. That's fact. Uh, yeah. But then other other parts, it's like, you know, th there's all kinds of shady things going around, even from our own side. Well, so... the, the, the difficulty is that... Um... I mean, getting, I, I, I would obviously understand within the Balkans, getting, I mean, people have different narratives of what occurred, you know, it's sort of like, and that narrative, I mean, it's, it's some of it is true, some of it was influenced by propaganda and power and all these things. And I think it's very difficult coming from any of those regions. And, and by the way, coming from South Africa for something comparable to really look at stuff objectively. Um, you know, it's it's because people's identity is so attached to what story being true that even if you come with the truth, they won't believe you. No, that's that, that's true. That's why I kind of it's hard to talk <laughs> about that things because people yeah, are still there's still a lot of people literally stuck in the Cold War, like in the pre 1990s, literally, mm -hmm. and they haven't moved on. And just like you can't have a conversation. Well, well, you, you like, see that in Africa as well. You see that in in, in Ukraine. I mean, there's still lots of bad blood <laughs> from the Soviet Union, and it's just people just don't get over it, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, there's still people who who say like uh, I uh, I wanted to go take a trip to Serbia, or you know, they, they still act like oh, if you step foot in Serbia, you're going to be killed by a Chetnik as as soon as you step foot. I'm like, what are you talking? I'm like, by that logic, uh, here here's an example. Uh, if you think about that, you know, go back to the 1860s in the U.S. So one half of the you know uh, America wanted to kill uh, the other half. So that does that mean that we can't go visit today? That means that that by that logic, that means I can't go you know, visit the other half of America. I have to continue hating them because we had a, you know, a civil war, you know, some hundred, uh, you know, whatever years ago. So, it's well, I, I mean, look, look at the U.S. election map. I mean, that is still, I mean, it's, it's not that they're going to kill each other, but there's clear cultural divisions from that war. You know, the streak sort of carries on in a way. Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah. No, that's fair enough. Um, yeah, I mean, um I want to get to another thing on the sort of geopolitical stance and stuff. Um, I mean, what do you think is um, like the end game for America in, say, China, Russia, Ukraine, all these things? Like, what do you think? Like, do you think they they know they they actually believe they can achieve the domination that they want? It's really, I mean, that's a it's a tough question because I feel like there are different games being played, and I don't know which one is. Um, you know, because there's a version that globalists have penetrated all the cabinets, you know, including China and, and Russia, and that, the, you know, w there are insiders within each country sort of working together. But then, you know, there's another version where sometimes to an extent that seems true, but then you see these real tensions between uh, the blocks. It, it, and it's difficult because it seems like almost we're in a different period of history. It seems like in all of pre-globalization history, things were simpler because you had these countries and empires that were just, it was more like real politic. But now we have this like globalist factor we have to throw in that's more 
it's it's but, but, but it's it isn't the the, the so I, I this is where i'm not entirely clear on i wonder how much the globalization one is exaggerated i mean there's obviously some of it but i i still look at a lot of what's going on as just good old you know competition between countries great game you mean sort of like yeah basically great game this is just the it's, it's sort of that and the globalization one um yeah, it's true. The Atlantic Council and um, you know WF is there. You can't ignore it. But th that to me seems to be just a tool for US hegemony. It, it doesn't seem to me to be much more than that. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's a powerful <laughs> tool, and they're using it to basically establish, I mean, control over a large swath uh, of a centralized technocratic digital control of a large swath of the the planet, with the goal to eventually get the entire planet but um it, i mean it's you also have history to guide you like the cycles of history the the, the peaks and declines and the, the west seem i mean nothing can go on forever and so the west does seem to be uh, on a decline and um the east does seem to be rising and so you know you've got the thucydides trap scenario where i i, I do think that we're going to end up in a third world war or some sort of you know major military conflict i just feel like that's that's inevitable so not that i want it of course but it's just i just feel like that's that's history so but i mean the the amount of conflict between nations have decreased though dramatically since the second world war and the amount of dead people have decreased you know russia ukraine being an exception but generally it's it's been a downward curve so it's like i mean is it really going to be conventional conflict or is it just like this asymmetric warfare well, I think it's going to be more like I've had some guests on William Robinson and others, and I think the final end goal, because if you're going into world government, then it just becomes it's a global civil war. It's all citizens versus their ruling class that would include Russians against the Russian ruling class, Chinese against the Chinese ruling class. Yes, and, it's and it's and feudal, feudalism, basically. Yeah. And I mean, I think this is the final sort of end game. And today I was reading I posted an article I mean, NATO is preparing for urban uh, wars as people migrate from rural to urban and they create these technocratic smart cities. Uh, the final enemy is not going to be a, a nation state. It's going to be the own, the, the dissidents, the, the, the people who will not go along with the tyrannical governments. Again, that's my feeling that the, the, this whole World Economic Forum system wants to create all dictatorships, uh, technocratic dystopias. And uh, the final enemy will be dissidents, just normal people who want to live as we've lived. Uh, at, I mean, here, here, I, I just read in, in, in Canada uh, a guy who had a, a bank account with Scotia Bank. Um, he complained that in his app there were the rainbow LGBT color. Every time he logged in, it showed like the LGBT rainbow. And he just went to ask, like, how do I not? I don't want to see this. This is not my thing. They closed his account. They said, oh, you, we don't want people like you having an account with us. And so Scotiabank just closed this guy's account because he just disagreed with the whole LGBT thing. And this is sort of like uh, that, that, that sort and of thing. There's, 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 there's no option to change your background. Like, <laughs> just close your account. <laughs> yeah, That's insane. Account. Yeah, I, I saw and another one of like, a, 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 I think it's a teacher in Ireland. It was on Twitter today. I don't yeah, know Ireland. Was... He refused to use the pronoun. And... Yeah, they fired him, arrested him, whatever. So but it's, but it's... I, I mean, a, a system like this cannot endure in a long time. I mean, I, I'd like you to be honest, I but, <laughs> but it, it just seems too perverse, too, to, yes, to, to, you know, so contrary to common sense to work. But I, I don't even understand the logic for, for, for people who are, you know, homosexual or lesbian or whatever. Like I've known, I've had friends grow, all growing up like, like this all my life or coworkers or acquaintances or students. And it's just like, you know, as someone who's not, the, doesn't believe in that. No, but I, I, my, my, my view is just you can do what you want, but don't, you know, it, it's not just that. It's that they're trying to force people to change their minds as if that's ever worked. You know? but, yeah, but, yeah, but my point is like myself as a Christian, I wouldn't want uh, some gay person to have their account banned. So why would yeah. you want uh, a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew have their account banned because they don't agree with your ideology? That's like, that's not tolerance, but it's total hypocrisy, you know, so. Yeah, and, and, and especially if a flag annoys you. I mean, I'm also annoyed by that flag, and I really don't care much. 
you know, so it's it's just I, I don't know. I, I I don't get the and and the zealotry. This is what gets me. It's like the people who do this stuff, um, the bankers or the vaccine guys or all of them. Climate. They think you know. the, the, your climate. You know all the BS. They they think they're scientists. They think they're enlightened. They they think they they're clever, and yet they cannot see that they're so religious and so um, you know zealous. I like. Uh, I had a past guest a couple of times, Jim Jatras, former uh, diplomat. He calls it uh, rainbow fascism, uh, and the, you know that encapsulates <laughs> the wokeism, the cancel culture. I mean, this is essentially globalism. You know, it, that includes the LGBT, transgender stuff, the uh, abortion, mm-hmm. everything. This is all part of this new totalitarian uh, regime. And so, I mean, it's the, that's the, uh, the, I'll, I'll tell you this one. I um, this weekend, uh, my wife and I go. We, so we stay in a small town just south of Paris. And there's like a market, um, you know, where they had like all the associations, you can clubs, basically, you can join uh, boxing clubs and churches and stuff. So they were standing there and they had their stalls. Okay. And the first one was the Catholics. And next to them were the Protestants. Next to them were the 5G skeptics. Okay. And next to them were the climate skeptics. Uh, or the, like the climate, you know, they, they check your carbon footprint, guys. Okay. So they were all in the same line. I'm like, okay, we're living in a time of cults. They all lined up and, and you can... You can sort of choose your cult. I mean, in a way, I, I don't mind that. If you if you go for that, choose your cult, but don't get me into it. That's where I draw the line. I get, I, yeah. I mean, it's that same principle that I'm talking about—that peaceful, nonviolent principle where um, I should have a, the right to, let's say, preach Christ to someone. Mm. But it's just like, hey, I'm telling you about it. You don't have to listen. You can go away. I'm not forcing it upon you. I never force anything upon anyone. You just don't have to listen. That's all. And and the same, the person has the right to do that to me, but to impose something. And then you, th- this gets into you're killing someone because if, if eventually they close down your bank account, um, then you can't buy food. You're going to starve to death, literally. Like yeah. just because they don't believe in what you believe, you're going to kill someone. Where's the, you know, where's the love and tolerance in that? Because I mean, just get, look, I, I had a podcast guest. Uh, I got some donations. I wanted to give one of my podcast guests, uh, who's a journalist, um, a donation because they live off of that. And my PayPal account is blocked. Uh, and I tried to do it through like my crypto account and, and I couldn't figure it out. I can't do it. It's like, there's no way for me now to, you know, pass off. It's just nuts. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it is. But I mean, what, what gives me hope, let me put it this way, and why I'm, I'm I, first of all, is, is, is the history of, of how the system South Africa came to collapse because it was an identity system. And then I, I just, I've traveled to so many countries where ordinary people always have a way of avoiding tax. You know, I've, I've, I've never met a businessman. I mean, when I got here to France, for example, I was filling in my tax form. And the guy is doing it. It's like, no, no, no. This is not how you do it. This is how you, you know, cheat the system. I'm like, oh, okay. Even the tax advisor is telling me how to cheat the system. You know, so <laughs> this is basically this is basically the culture that's that's rife around the world. So I'm just saying, you know, in a way, I want to tell them bring it on. Um, not that I would welcome the system to be imposed, but I, I always like tell the people who, you know, who are in charge of this, the the, the engineers and the the IT guys, like. Good luck is basically what I'm going to tell them to think that there won't be an uprising and a resistance to to this type of thing. Yeah, and I guess the sooner it comes, the sooner it'll collapse. Uh, if, if you know, so <laughs> yeah, the sooner they, they will come to its own inter- inherent contradictions. Yeah, man. No, it's a good thing. Yeah. Um, good question. Last question for you. Yeah, sort of like uh, yeah, just, this. I just had, I just on that yeah. point though. Like today, I was reading news out of Ecuador. Uh, mm-hmm. A video I posted it. I posted it in the Geopolitics Empire uh, Telegram channel, but it was a woman from Ecuador, and they had a whole minority report like room uh, in this. I forget which city in Ecuador, and she's talking about. It literally looks like a minority report. You got dozens yeah. and dozens of workers at their stations and the and the screens that are monitoring the whole city, and she's like, "We're rolling out fifteen thousand AI um, surveillance cra- cameras across the city, and they're going to have like a total of forty one thousand and they can quantify everything and they can figure out if someone you know jaywalked or and she was even saying like pre-crime she was saying if we can identify if someone it looks like they have a gun or they're about to do something and it's just like um and then they're, they're doing the same thing in mexico they're rolling out the same system they're, they're bringing out the internet they're creating the same surveillance structure so uh again it's like i know you're uh, pessimistic but at the same time i see them like 
they're rolling this stuff well, out. Well, the thing is, in South Africa, we have a lot of copper thieves. So I'm looking at those cameras. I'm thinking, geez, there's a lot of copper to steal. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of recycled material. <laughs> I mean, I, I hope so. But I, I, how do you then get them? Because if there's forty thousand cameras, if you go to get one camera, oh no, no, but you you make the false assumption that the law actually gets enforced in South Africa. You know, right. you get you, the police is corrupt. So, you know, the police is probably the guy stealing it. For for all we know. <laughs> So, you know, like I, I, I was because I was looking at, um, I mean, not something less more mundane, like um, hydrogen, for example. I don't know if you know about the hydrogen economy. They're all talking about this crap now. And um, it might sort of theoretically work in Europe. It's going to make cost of living more expensive because hydrogen has got worse properties than methane gas, for example. Um, but how are you going to do it in Africa where we have these massive distances or over in the United States? You know, um, you can't do that. So, like, it's it's sort of like I see it, at the end of the day, I see all of this as like one big black hole that is waiting to collapse. But you know, how much money needs to be poured into the hole before the people realize it's BS? I don't know. But you, I mean, you're an energy guy. How would you say? Let, let's say this black hole. I mean, as you say, it's going to collapse. But I have another a, a number of people telling me saying that whatever the case going forward we're just going to have to like they say they use terms like degrowth or we're just going to have to get used to living yeah. on, on less uh, energy or less c consumption r rolling things back a bit y do you think that will be the future well i mean um i can only look at the past and say no um that's been predicted since the 1970s uh, a, a good uh, guide on this is the um i know the head of the south african free market foundation Kaiwani of leon low and he always said the good best therapy for against this stuff is to actually read what the guys like are doing you know who are in favor of this or saying read environmentalists read like george moinbot he's always depressed none of his stuff works you know, so I, I see it sort of as that way. It's like a desperation. Um, I mean, the death growth stuff cannot work. I mean, in the long run, um, whenever there's a, a small increase in, in fuel everywhere around the world, there's always a riot. Okay, I don't know if you remember the one in Kazakhstan that um, okay, it was a bit instigated by color revolution, but it was a fuel riot. Afri the Arab Spring was a price of fuel, increased the price of great bread, and that exploded North Africa. So if you touch people's energy prices and their standards of living, you're creating massive upheaval. And I mean, just this year, we saw Boris Johnson lose power. Macron lost the absolute majority in the French parliament. The Estonian government came to a fall, and Mario Draghi in Italy came to a fall. All of that is linked to the price of energy. And what is the UK government saying now? Well, we're going to frack, changing their religious stance. So, so I sort of see it that way. It's sort of like we, we, we're doing stupid stuff. The public has a massive backlash, like with the vaccine passport. It wasn't popular. Um, eventually, the government just could not ignore these mass protests. And then they sort of story, sort of backtrack from their story. And then we go back in a good direction. Then the crap comes again. And, you know, it's like a pendulum. Yeah. And I had, I had I had Doomberg on uh, talking about energy basically being the cause of every war and inflation, social unrest, and so forth. So yeah, I I would agree with that. Um, I mean, I would bet. Let me put it this way: whenever there's energy crisis, I bet you there's a coup d'état somewhere in the world. Um, I did not expect before COVID, like whenever there's a disease, there's a coup d'état. But now I'm kind of convinced that disease, wars, climate, you know, any any scary story, you will you'll find something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have anything planned for this year? Anything that's uh, on your horizon? In terms of just trying well, to survive the Great Reset, or what? <laughs> <laughs> We've been surviving for three years, man. You're alive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, in in what sense? I mean, I'm just doing what I continue to do. I got my TNT radio show every day and Geopolitics mm -hmm. Empire and. And, and how, how do you contrast being on radio compared to being a podcast? Is there, is there a difference or is it the same type it's of just more in, oh, just the TNT thing is it's more intense because it's a daily and it's mm. live. So it's like with the podcast before I can just take off a week, you know, do, do it when I want. But here it's like a fixed schedule and that sort of limits me. And, and, and how do you, I mean, whenever I do a podcast, um, especially when it's a deep topic, like uh, the one I did on, 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 Soviet Union now, um, like the next few days, that topic sort of messes with your mind. I don't know if it's the same, but you're really going through the arguments and and, and stuff. Yeah, I mean, like, I, example, my last guest was uh, Chris Newby on Geopolitics and Empire, and she got Lyme disease, and she wrote a book on 
how Lyme uh, disease was a U.S. biological warfare uh, wow. weapon, and she actually found the guy who discovered Lyme, Will Willie. He died like I don't know what five, six, seven years ago, and that he actually sort of like confessed. She met, she interviewed him in person. That he's like, yeah, uh, that uh, he he was in the U.S. bioweapons program, and that yeah, they were trying to insert uh, debilitating uh, disease into ticks uh, and 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 in insects, and so. I, I read her book, you know, I purchased her book uh, and I, I read the book. And she, as you say, so like if I prepare for a guest, I uh, if they have books, I'll read it uh, at least uh, one of their books. Or if they don't have books, I'll, you know, I have to go spend time doing a deep dive on them, reading their articles and, and stuff like that. So, yeah. And, and on the line, this is one. Do you believe that story? I do. I would tend. I don't see why. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I just. My, my whole take on this whole lab leak stuff from the beginning um, has been, I, I still think it's all one pack of lies, including that story. Like, right, but I, what's, I, your, what's your take on the, just for example, the uh, COVID thing then, that there was no... I just, I just think they, re, re, they re-blended existing diseases. They just take people that were dying and they gave it a new name. It's like, you know, Cassius Clay became Muhammad Ali and he became stronger, you know. It's just sort I of mean, like... in, 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 I, I believe that in effect that like regardless if, if it was uh, a bioweapon or not, it's just like there was no pandemic. There was no reason to lock down, but I could still see that there still being some sort of. Well, I, I, I see there was a lab. Um, I mean, that's obvious that there was one. I, I do believe there's a program. I question sophistication of the science. I mean, I, I just think a lot of this is like money laundering um sort of you know my take on it i mean i i because when reading up on this stuff i read the uh, into the apartheid regime's biological weapon like what was written about it and the best thing they could do is like ecstasy <laughs> to try and get people addicted i mean that's not sophisticated science right I mean, so but, but the other thing i i don't know i would agree with you but just there's something i can't shake like this is summer here in croatia i mean i i can't remember in the summertime especially people a whole slew of people getting an infectious disease. So my whole family and people in the church here that I attend, like one yeah. uh, recent Sunday, 20 to 30 percent of the people didn't show up because they all got sick with a really bad cough. And, you know, it's like a flu at the height of summer. And then in Kazakhstan last summer, that happened with people that we knew. And then in Mexico, people keep getting sick. So it's just like... Yeah, no, I, I, I hear you. They, they all... Something's going on. I don't know what's going on, but it's just really weird. I, I mean, the question is, like, how do you prove cause and effect in any of this? I, I don't know. I, I mean, you have to really go into the deep analysis. And then when I read on PON, the PCR test and all that stuff, I'm like, it, it doesn't it, it doesn't look as if it added up to me. Yeah, but I, I agree with you. On, on a broader picture, I, I think a lot of this was just PA propaganda from day one yeah, I don't, you know. again i don't believe the pcr test i've never taken one so again but just something strange is i feel like n neither version ex fully explains everything mm -hmm. like you said the flu rebranded um i still feel, find there's holes in the story or even the the bioweapons angle there's holes in the story so i feel like there are missing pieces pieces to this puzzle i i, I don't know i just uh, don't do, buy you, the, do you think we're ever going to get the truth Probably not. I mean, have we found out the just truth about JFK or, or, or Pearl Harbor? Have they admitted no? So 9 9-11. <laughs> 9-11. Um, I, I, I'm just really irked lately by the no virus thing that's sort of running on the back of all this where they're saying contagious or infectious disease doesn't exist. Yeah, And it's like history is full of... Epidemic. I did a conversation with um, Sam Bailey on that. It's actually very interesting. It's, it's not that much quackery. Oh, what's, what's sort of the takeaway from that? Well, they, they take the view that most disease is a toxicological effect, right? So it's poisons in the environment as opposed to infectious disease. And for example, the conquest of the New World, we all said it is, um, what do you call it, a, a smallpox that killed the Indians. But there is evidence that smallpox predates the arrival of, this, uh, of the conquistadors. Um, and we know the conquistadors killed the whole food supply. So the point is that when you destroy people's environment, you put them under stress, particularly, they get sick. That's been proven. And when you take their food away, I bet you get sick. So the, the argument is what we call the disease. It's, it's not that people aren't dying. It's got another cause. Uh, we know fluke associates with low vitamin D levels, for example. 
but you also get summer flus, which is not uncommon. I mean, you just explained something like that. So the argument they just make is that. And then the other thing, which the strongest argument in the, in, for them is that we know the PCR, none of the tests are specific. They cannot pinpoint the virus, neither antibody or PCR, any of them. So you're, you're measuring something relatively probabilistic, and, and that already makes me skeptical of the whole basic science behind it. So that that's sort yeah. of where they where they where they come from. Um, but, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I can't shake the, the there's no in the history contagious you know in, in infection just uh, my whole life and you know people get uh, I've lived in different you know half a dozen countries and just gotten you see but, it, it, parasites it, it, would be real I would assume I mean um, if you say there's no tropical disease when malaria stings you I, I, I find that a bit it's a stretch of the imagination I mean we know that mosquitoes so. Again, I, I don't know, um, but they make an argument that is valid to me that there's maybe more than one reason why people are sick. Because give this an example. Two people test positive for COVID or whatever you call it. Why does one get sick and the other one doesn't? You know, that's sort of like the logic. So well, maybe the, there the must tests, be something else. I don't believe the tests, but then again, it's your, you know, your immune system. Um, but again, I, I would separate the case of whatever has been going on the last two years versus the history prior. I feel like they're saying... Um, whatever COVID is, is not a virus. Okay, I could get behind that. But then to say from the beginning of human history that there's no such thing as infection. Well, well, I mean, it, we, it, we don't even have to be talking about virus, but you know, you have contagion, bacteriological stuff, and they seem to be saying none of that exists. It's just toxicity. Yeah, that, that's, that's, a bit too, that's a bit too far for me because uh, what, what is true, though, is that even tuberculosis and other diseases have been um, going down long before people started um, having antibiotics even, before vaccination. I think that's due to the hygiene. People say like in the 20th century. Where okay, but then the argument is that's the environment. You see? So just extend that. If, if, if deaths came down 90% before we had any of these interventions, why don't we just do what we did for the 90%? Why the 1, 2, 3% that you attribute or 10%, 20, whatever it is for the medical interventions? A, a lot of these guys, by the way, are very much into natural cures. So take that into account. No, I am too. So yeah. No, yeah, okay, but like they against all medicine. I mean, I like aspirin, for example. If you have a headache, I mean, I'm not against some medication, oh, neither, but yeah. I'm against I'm against over medication. I think that's just oh. ridiculous. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So anyway, so the the, the point they make is just that. Um, I mean, uh, uh, it's sort of like it's it's a massive counter narrative. I I I get what you're saying, um, but yeah, it's out there. I mean, people's stuff is to. To look at it and people can the nice thing about the internet even if they censor you can still make up your own mind you know yeah i mean i don't i definitely don't discourage going down different avenues it's just people yeah. as you were talking about zealots there are just some people uh, again in my like comment section just w w when i they seem to be going to an extreme and it, 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 i would use mm -hmm. the example of like let's say 9 11 it's like okay i believe 9 11 was an inside job but uh, I, I move on with life, and then there, but there's people who they're just like, why don't you talk about 9/11? 9/11 was an inside job. It's like if you don't talk about it, you're a controlled opposition. Or I'm like, and I, 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 I mean, I just take the 9/11 one. I mean, I as an engineer can tell you the way the buildings came down makes completely sense to me from an aeroplane, even Building Seven, by the way, from the fire. That is possible. So you don't need to invent demolition and stuff. But my just dodgy question has been, nobody ever asked who funded the attacks. You know, that's kind of where you would look at first. And, and why did the money come from Saudi Arabia, most probably? And even Obama admitted it at one stage. So it's, it's not like I'm not even going down the, the deep rabbit hole of that story. I'm just saying like what I've been told about 9-11 does not add up to me. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm convinced. I mean, World Trade Center 7 was demolitions. No plane hit it. <laughs> you have the 3000 AE 9-11 scientists and engineers. Um, the, for me, that's like the the one thing that sort of shows you, aha, uh -huh, there was some sort of inside job. And then the rest of it is just kind of, it's hard to figure out, as you say, who, you know, who's ultimately <laughs> culpable, but there had, there had to be people within the U S government. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. That's my, that's my view. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, no, I agree. I, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know how, I mean, I haven't looked into it that much to be honest. Um, Maybe because I don't want, I'm probably too scared to see what I'm going to find. But um, what I do know is that the excuses given to invade Afghanistan and Iraq seems to be complete BS, <laughs> you know, whatever well, I, the course was. I mean, just the false flags. I feel like that's just a normal 
aspect of uh, all of history. Like, I, I, I don't have any favorites. I think the 1999 Moscow apartment bombings were a Russian false flag, a state terror, as I think the, what they, the ones that, that got Putin elected. That, uh... Yeah, yeah, I think that was false flag state terror. I think the American 2001 was false flag state terror. Uh, South Africa, I think in 1989, I remember the reading there was some case was, you know, South African example of a, I don't know if it uh, was carried out or they stopped it b beforehand. Every country has carried out. It's a simple. Dark well, yeah, movie. I mean, the South Africa, the one that, that always got me, there was um, when Nelson Mandela um, negotiated for the end of apartheid regime, there was a more radical version of Mandela by the name of uh, Chris Harney. And he basically wanted to kill all the whites in the country. And this guy ended up being dead, being killed by the member of the opposition. And nobody, like the story just, is, it, you know, it doesn't add up, the whole story. And, and lots of people suspected that he was killed by the government and the ANC to not stop the negotiations. You know, that type of thing. So, yeah, there's, I mean, the fact that people murder for power is, is, is not controversial, I would think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyways, um, yeah, I think we've we've gone to an hour over here. So, so I'd like to give you if there's like another like minute or so to tell people what you're planning on doing or any last message for them, and then call it a night. No, just you know, bat down the hatches, prepare for the end of the world as we know it. <laughs> <laughs> Doomsday. <laughs> Sustained increased inflation, uh, technological control grid. I mean, so many people I talk to are just moving out to rural areas, moving to Mexico. Um, move to know, Mexico. So, There's the answer, you know. Move to Mexico. Uh, no, yeah, I mean, nothing more than the usual stuff that I think a lot of us uh, mm. follow. Um, yeah, and I just, I'm just, I'm just going to continue interviewing people who I think are. Uh, interesting on geopolitics and empire.com as well as uh, tnt radio dot live so those are my places mm -hmm. you can find me it's... and yeah so I, I encourage people to watch uh, your, your podcast it's been informative to me some of your guests have not convinced me but nonetheless they're interesting to listen to and uh... yeah, that's the point. i mean you you've also <laughs> had interesting guests uh I, I i there's people i've never heard of and i'm like well, that that's interesting so i mean that's also yeah, yeah, it's, it's part of the part of the ecosystem. That's how I see the podcast. By the way, it's like I don't see this as getting lots of followings and stuff. It's just you, you sort of add to the conversation. You know, you push push the conversation, and then um, don't let the media gatekeep the conversation. I think it's the important thing. Yeah, maybe you should just interview like uh, all of the staples. You know, the uh, Peter McCullough's and Naomi Wolf, <laughs> and and just you know that way. I I mean they're all great. I just I just kind of like. If I see this person's been on the 20 interview circuits, I'm just kind of turned off. Like, I'll listen to their interview, but then I don't see what's the point of them having been on. It's probably to my own detriment because, you know, I could probably get more popular by having more of these popular people. So, yeah, I mean, this is also, I mean, I stopped talking about um, COVID, to be honest. I stopped talking even about climate. I'm fed up with that at this stage. I've done a lot of that. Talk about that. What are you, what are you <laughs> Well, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm back into contemporary politics. I, I, I'm back into believing the government works for me and, um, you know, the media doesn't tell the truth, tells the truth. And, and for a while, I mean, not that I'm not, I want to say this, I, I don't discount the current institutions. I think some of them serve a purpose and some governments are necessary and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think it's all working for a major plan, but I do think sometimes they fail the public at large and then you need to push back against that narrative. Fair yeah. enough. I mean, I mean, yeah. I I think there is still some public control um, of you know our local government uh, agencies and institutions. But I I, I, let me ask you this: Do you still vote? Well, I mean, I haven't. I don't even remember the last time I've I've <laughs> the last time I voted okay. was for Ron Paul, uh, and I only recently became I uh, Mexican. I was not allowed to vote in the Mexican. Um, no, no. Because I, I, I got I became a citizen like a few months too uh, late to be able to get my voter card for voting in the, in but, the but if you if you're a US citizen, can you have two citizenships? I thought you could I've have got one. three citizenships. <laughs> Don't so, tell that to the Homeland Security. <laughs> yeah, it's completely legit. No, I, I thought Americans had to have only one. Like no, that's not that's not like North Korea or China or Kazakhstan. Well, well, in, India one. does India does that, for example, and China does that. So. Germany does that as well. So um, no, that's all perfectly uh, 
legal depending on the country. So in, in the country that I'm a citizen uh, of, you're allowed to have multiple, uh, you know. Okay, so um, I'd like to thank my American, uh, Croatian, Mexican <laughs> guest. Thank you very much. That, more, more accurate is Croatian, American, Mexican. <laughs> Croatian, 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 American, Mexican guest. Thank you very much for the conversation. And uh, to, the, to your listeners that's going to listen to this, please subscribe. I need to monetize the channel. Thank you very much. Yes, we'll go to this good stuff. Thank you. Thank you.